So um, hello, everybody. Uh, if you don't know me or don't recognize my voice, my name is Kevin Grenier. I work in the customer services group for SimCenter Testing Solutions. Uh, my email's here. If you have any questions after the seminar, please feel free to reach out to me, and uh, I'll have my email again at the very end. Moving from acceleration to displacement, and I want to talk about a couple things to be careful with. Whenever you integrate, some artifacts can cause the results to be far from reality. So I'm going to show some examples of how to avoid these integration errors and get meaningful data. And I'm going to do that in the time domain and the frequency domain. And I'll show Test Lab Classic as well as Test Lab Neo. So like I said, we'll talk about time domain versus frequency domain results as well as Classic versus Neo. And uh, here's a simple um, example where I have a accelerometer on the pinion vertical. So this is on an axle. And I'm getting about seven and a half millimeters of displacement. And I've, I've been using the same data set for about 22 years that I've been here at uh, Siemens slash LMS. So I know this data set very well, and I know the results that I should expect. And I'm going to use this to show the integration steps. So this is one of the most popular response line questions. I've been here for about 22 years, like I said, and uh, we get this question all the time. And usually people, integrate in the time domain and they get really strange results and uh, they don't know why or they integrate in the frequency domain and it causes issues at low frequency and that throws off the overall level so um, we're going to talk about some ways to work around that and i have a link to a knowledge base article and if i follow this link no, there it is okay so how to correctly integrate the time domain data. So this is a FAQ slash knowledge base article one of our co-ops put together for us. And it talks you through all the steps and uh, shows you some examples. Looks like it's a slightly different data set. But this is a really good knowledge base article to have. So keep in mind that's out there for you. And uh, these are the steps. So I copied them here. So first thing we re recommend you do is remove any trends in the data. So if we're using traditional test lab, we call it D-trend AC, and this fits a low degree polynomial through the data and subtracts it. So this is gonna remove any drift in the data, and that helps prepare the data for the integration steps. The next step is to upsample by a factor of four. And the reason we do that is some of the techniques, uh, mostly Simpson, Four Point, and Bode, are sensitive to high frequency effects, and it looks like a sawtooth effect on the data. So to avoid that, we're going to upsample by a factor of four so that when we do the integration, those artifacts are really, really high frequency, and they will downsample later back to the original. The trapezium method isn't as sensitive to that, but for sure the first three methods, Simpson, Four Point, and Bode, are very sensitive to those high frequency effects. So after we upsample to a factor of four higher, then we integrate. So we either do a single integration or a double integration to go from velocity or displacement. And then here it says the point about the trapezium method. If you're happy with the results, you may not need to upsample and downsample. So rather than five steps, that would reduce it down to three steps, just a detrend, integrate, and filter. Then after we do the integration, we use the resampling command to go back down to the original sampling frequency. And then as a last step, we apply a high pass filter. And uh, if you don't do that, you're going to have a big offset to the data, a big drift. And usually that high pass filter is somewhere between one to two and a half hertz. And you have to be a little bit careful with that because you need to remove the high frequency, of, I'm sorry, the low frequency effects caused by the integration, but that's also the largest displacement values. So you don't want to put it too high because then you're getting rid of the, some of the displacements you're looking at. So that depends a little bit on the motion of the object on if you're expecting to have motion down below five hertz or so. So here is some examples in Test Lab Classic. But the first set here is, first I detrend AC. I'm doing it to channel 12, and I'm doing a second order polynomial. That's a default. Then I'm using the resampling command to go to a sample frequency of 8192. And that's because the original sample rate was 2048. So 8192 is four times that. Then I do the double integration in one step. I resample back down to the original, which is 2048. And then I do a high pass filter at two and a half hertz. 
And uh, you're going to use option two on the high pass filter, which is a zero phase filter. So we're going to take it through the filter forwards and backwards. So any distortion would be at the end of the time history instead of the beginning of the time history. So this first set of formulas stores all the inter interim results. So it's saving the results as channel 101 to channel 105. The second set uses variables. So the commands are exactly the same, but we're going to store the results into a variable and use those in the formulas. So the only result saved is the displacement values, channel 100. The third formula is a nested formula. And you can see now we've nested everything. So I have one line that I can do this integration on channel 12. The last formula is a nested formula where we're using CHX as a variable, and that X is going to be incremented using the repeat for and increment columns. So in the time signal calculator, I can see I'm repeating from 4 to 12. So that's going to integrate or double integrate from channel 4 through channel 12 with an increment of 1. So it's going to do all the channels from channel 4 to channel 12. And uh, this is how we would do it in the time domain for Test Lab Classic. And I'm going to show this too. Um, I'll bring up the software in a little bit and show that as well. In Neo, we're going to use the double integrate or enhanced integration methods. So enhanced integration would be a single integration going from acceleration to velocity, whereas double integrate would be a double integration from acceleration to displacement. And that is a combined method. And we've exposed four parameters. So we've exposed the first integration method, the second integration method, the drift correction frame length, and the high pass filter cutoff. So we allow you to change those four things. And then the description here in blue says, and this is straight from the documentation, when double integrating, we will remove the drift first, then we'll upsample by a factor of four, we will then double integrate, resample to the original, and then finally apply a high pass filter. And again, I say that the high pass filter is normally from one to two and a half rates. So if I double click inside that method, these are all the steps inside the double integration method. So basically, we're going to do a drift and offset correction. And I show you the settings that can be set there. Then we're going to do an upsample. In the Neo, we don't need to tell it the, the um, sample frequency. We can actually also use a resampling factor. So here I can upsample by a factor of four. Uh, that's something traditional test lab doesn't have. You have to tell us the sample frequency. So it's nice in Neo that we can set it to be an upsample factor of four. Then we're going to do the first integration. We'll do a second integration. Then we'll do a resampling by a factor of a quarter to go back to the original sampling frequency. Then we're going to apply a high pass Butterworth filter with a sixth order at zero phase. And then finally, we could go to a metadata editing method and change some things. So if you wanted to change the point ID or direction or something like that. And um, by default, we don't change anything. But that method's there if you wanted to change some of the metadata up to you. OK, so let's show that inside the software. So this is traditional test lab. And basically, I have this pinion vertical acceleration inside my input basket. And it goes to about 9G. And then I'm going to double integrate with no steps correcting it. And then I'll detrend, resample, double integrate, resample back down to the original frequency, apply a high pass filter. And then I have the results um, also nested. So we'll just to show you the results for displacement one, which has no massaging of the data, and then displacement two with the suggested steps, and displacement three with the suggested step as a nest. So if I calculate, so I can show you displacement one, so this should show you immediately that something's wrong. It's showing as, if I change this unit here to meter, it's showing my axle is moving by 519 meters. So that should tell you as a big warning flag that something's wrong. And you should also look at the shape of the curve. You know, that has some kind of a really big drift to it or some type of a polynomial to it that's very low order. 
So the shape doesn't look right, as well as the displacement being far too large. So if I look at the second displacement result, so there I'm seeing about 7.45, so that's channel 105. And then here I can see channel 106. So both of those get exactly the same results. I can verify that if I try to put two curves on top of each other. And if I zoom in down here, okay, you can see that both those results as a nested formula and without nesting get the same results. If I wanted to look at the displacement before the high pass filter, I can see that it's got about 873 millimeters of displacement. And you can see it's got a low, low frequency sinusoid to the data. That's why we need to apply the high pass filter. And then when we apply that high pass filter, we get these very nice results as shown here. Okay, so now let's see how that would look inside NEO. Okay, so here's NEO. And I have the data in the input basket. So if I look at the data in my input basket here. Okay, so there it is. And then I've got the integration steps here. I'm going to do a trapezium. And then I'm going to do a second trapezium. And then I have the double integrate method. And in the double integrate method, I'm telling it trapezium. I'm doing a one second drift correction. And then, or I'm using one second as a frame size for the drift. And then we go ahead and are going to use a two and a half hertz high pass filter. If I wanted to see what's inside that double integrate method, I just double click in it. And now I can see inside, these are the settings on the drift correction, or drift and offset correction. This is setting for the uh, resample. And you can see there's two choices here. I can set the sample rate or the factor. We're using a factor. And then I can see the first integration, second integration, resampling down by a factor of a quarter, my high pass filter, and then finally a double integration step. And if I want, I can double click on the in or the out and then collapse it back down. So if I wanted to look at these results, if I look at section one here in the time domain, and if I look at there's the uh, acceleration in Gs, so nine, nine Gs, and the displacement down to 7.5 millimeter. And if I look at this session here, so there's the original one. Yeah, this is the one that's five, 519,000 millimeters. So the green curve is without any steps to correct. And then the blue curve is after we've taken the steps to do the remove the drift, the upsampling, the integration, then the downsampling and then a high pass filter. So we're seeing very similar results in NEO 7.5 millimeters that we saw in traditional or classic test lab. So that's a proper way to do the integration inside NEO, as well as the proper way to do the integration inside classic. Every now and then I have somebody that wants to do resampling, I'm sorry, wants to do um, maybe get the relative displacement between two channels. So I could do that by doing a really long formula. So here would be basically channel 12 going all the way down to displacement. And then I could come in the formula over here and I could change and put another channel here and maybe channel 13. And that would calculate the relative displacement between two channels by just um, integrating the two of them as nested formulas. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Okay, so those are the steps for Neil. And then if I wanted to do it into the frequency domain, you want to be a little bit careful there. So first we could integrate in the time domain, as I just showed, and take that displacement data and process that to the frequency domain. Or as a, as a time data processing step, we could go to the time domain filtering at the top and set a high pass filter of from one to two and a half hertz as shown here. That would be one option. The second option would be to use the bins to clear setting to set the first couple of spectral lines to zero when processing. So by default, um, bins to clear is zero. And then if I switch the output format to velocity or di displacement, we're going to do a single integration or a double integration. Here I've got it set to displacement, so it's going to do a, a, a double integration. And then what happens is you might get a large spike at zero hertz or the first spectral line. 
So if I set the first bin to clear, it would set zero hertz to exactly zero amplitude. If I put two bins to clear, it's going to put the first two spectral lines to zero. So here in this example, I have um, one hertz resolution. So it would put the um, zero hertz and one hertz amplitude to zero before it does the integration step. So that's called bins to clear. And it's available not on the acoustic um, group because that usually isn't going to be integrated. But if you go to the vibration channel group or the other channel group, you'll see the output format setting where you can set it to unchanged acceleration, velocity, or displacement. And then you'll see the uh, bins to clear setting as well. In NEO, uh, basically, there's an option to trend removal. So basically, that would take the time history and then remove the trend from it before we did the integration step. So here I'm just telling the um, spectrum average to calculate either a spectrum or an auto power, but I'm changing the vibration output format to displacement, and I've turned on the option for trend removal, and I've turned off the option for RPM and angle channels only, because I actually want to remove the trend on my acceleration data. And then the second set of settings is for the spectrum map. So there I'm telling my spectrum map to track on time, and I'm telling it to do an auto power with one hertz resolution. I've changed the output format to be displacement. I've turned on trend removal, but I've turned off the option to RPM and angle channels only, because again, I want to remove the trend on my acceleration data. So let's go back to test lab. So if I go to time data processing here, but uh, if I wanted to look at these settings and if I do it for stationary, okay. So basically I told it I was gonna do a hundred averages as a linear average and I use one Hertz resolution. And then under channel processing, I went to vibration group since my data is in the vibration. And then I have um, auto powers with a handing window, first bins to clear. I'm going to displacement. And then I was going to change the setting. And then if you didn't want to do bins to clear, I could go here to time domain and set a high pass filter and set your high pass filter to one to two and a half hertz. And then if I look at the setting for when I did the attract results, I can load these settings. So there I have 120 seconds of data. So I told it to track for 200 seconds. So it'll just stop when I get to um, 120 seconds. I've got one second increment. I've got one Hertz resolution on my data. Under channel processing, displacement, and then I'm gonna to start to clear the bins or I'm gonna do a high pass filter the same way. So if I look at the navigator, and if I switch to my stationary results, so the red curve here, which has a amplitude of four millimeters down at about one Hertz is without any steps to massage the data. And then these are the curves, well, I'm sorry, the red curve here. Oh, so it's the same as been clear, it looks like. And then if I look at these other results, these are the different results when I clear one, two, three, four, and five bins. And you can see that the first two curves have a really high amplitude, whereas the other ones are pretty close to zero. And then if I move out towards five hertz, all, all the M curves have the same values. So basically, we had to worry about maybe the data below four to five hertz. And then above that, everything's fine. So that's clearing the bins. The other way to do it is to look at no, uh, no massaging of the data and then doing a one hertz filter and a two and a half hertz filter. So I can see at one hertz, the one hertz filter got a little bit lower amplitude, but it was really a two and a half hertz filter that brought it back down to 0.1. And again, after five hertz or so, all the curves are exactly the same. So that's for stationary data. That shows the effects of a one hertz, two and a half hertz filter versus clearing the bins. If I look at the waterfall data, 
So this is the waterfall data. So the top left curve here is basically with, without any extra steps. The bottom one, as I said, the middle one here is a one hertz high pass filter. The bottom left waterfall is a two and a half hertz filter. The top right has one bin cleared and is very obvious in the second color map over here where we clear five bins from zero to five hertz. The data has all been set to zero amplitude. I show the overall levels here, and I can see the difference in the overall levels. So red is has a very high value at this 46 seconds, 7.59. And then if I go to one hertz high pass filter, it drops down, and then two and a half hertz filter. So the overall level is much, much lower with a two and a half hertz filter applied versus no filter applied. I can do the same thing if I look at the different bins. There's one bin cleared. Not, not much effect at all. And then I can see two bins cleared versus five bins cleared. So it clearly has an effect on the data. And uh, when you're doing a run up or run down, we really see that in the overall level. One other way to compensate for that is I've got data to 2048. So I'm going to have basically an overall level all the way out to from zero to 1024. So one other way to get a second overall level would be to calculate a frequency section. And maybe I want to do it maybe 512, and then maybe set it to frequency. And maybe I want this to be from 5 to 1024. So this would be another way to calculate a pseudo overall level from 5 hertz to 1024, if I was worried about that low frequency. Okay, so let's see how neat. Um, one other thing I wanted to show is, well, I guess I'll come back to that. Let me show it in Neil first. So now if I switch to one of the other sections here. So here under the spectrum average command, if I scroll down, I can see here this trend removal. And if I look at the spectrum map, I've got the same choice here, trend removal. And I'm going to calculate an overall level from that. So if I look at these results, these are the auto powers with no trend removal. So there's the color map on the left, and then the averaged auto power on the right. And then this is with trend removal, and they really look similar to me here, but the overall levels are a little bit different. So you can see there's slightly different curves especially at the startup of the run, they've got quite a bit different shape. So the red curve is no trend removal and the green is with the trend removal turned on. So that would be another way to compensate in NEO to go from acceleration to displacement in making use of this trend removal on the commands down here at the bottom. Okay, so that was showing the integration steps in the frequency domain in Test Lab Classic, as shown here, or the high pass filter, as well as in Neo, by turning on trend removal and making sure your channels are being um, done properly. And I, I accomplish that by uh, turning off RPM and angle channels only. You also want to be a little bit careful when you're integrating within the picture or within a display without following the previous recommendations. So basically, I could put any spectrum I want in a display and then right click on the Y axis and change the processing and tell it to integrate or double integrate from the display. And you want to be a little bit careful doing that. So if I do that, and that's the same in Classic or Neo, the same settings are there. So let me show that in Classic. Okay, so here I have gone to processing and I told it to double integrate here in the front. And then I placed the process data in the back. And you can see here, the red is the acceleration data. So just by right-clicking on the y-axis and double integrating, it's got a really high 4.7 millimeter displacement. Whereas the other results, if I look at these other steps with clearing the different bins, you can see I'm getting much, much lower amplitude. Okay, And I also have a cursor here, so you can see it in the cursor that um, at one hertz, basically, I've got 4.7 millimeters of displacement without doing any correction. And then I'm really, really close to zero 
when I start either applying a high pass filter or clearing the bins. And once I move over to five hertz, basically all the curves have the same settings, have the same results. Okay, so be careful with that. So a couple of gotchas I put together um, as I was putting these slides together. Double integrating time domain data without precautions. Be careful. Uh, you really need to massage the data by um, removing the drift first, upsampling by a factor of four, doing your integration steps, downsampling by a factor of four, and finally removing a high pass filter. Second bullet point, double integrating when processing frequency domain data without using a high pass filter or setting some bins to zero or doing trend removal. Third point, looking at overall level without managing bullet two. So we've had some questions from customers when they want to know why their over level is too high. And it's either caused by a problem at zero hertz during testing or a problem at zero hertz when integrating. A test lab classic requires knowing the original sample frequency. So um, it doesn't have a resampling by a factor. You have to specify the sampling frequency. So we've had customers um, basically create a formula set and give it to their coworkers. And if the sampling frequency is not set right, the integration method doesn't go well. So perhaps their original data was 1024 hertz as a sampling frequency. They give that to somebody that's got data at a much higher frequency, well, they're gonna have problems with the, um, with the double integration. So in Test Lab Classic, you wanna be careful sharing those formula sets. Uh, make sure everybody knows that they need to upsample and downsample by a factor of four. So they need to know what the sampling frequency of the data is. Um, NEO doesn't have that problem because we have an upsampling factor as well as resampling through a specific sample frequency. Another gotcha would be managing the high pass filter. We want to remove the low frequency artifacts due to the integration, but they're the largest displacements. So I normally put it somewhere between one to two and a half hertz. But if you know you have motion at that really low frequency, you want to be careful doing that. So it depends a little bit on what you're testing. Uh, la uh, next point is how low does the accelerometer measure? Uh, most ICP Excels have a high pass filter of 0 0.5 hertz, but they're not very reliable above that. So make sure you check the specifications on the accelerometer. Make sure it's a low frequency Excel. And uh, possibly you might need to use a DC Excel to go down to that lower frequency or use a displacement sensor instead. The very last point is a lot of customers don't realize in channel setup, there's a high pass cutoff filter. And uh, even if you don't see it, it's still being used. So in all your acquisition products, go to your channel visibility and make sure that the HP cutoff is there. And depending on the different hardware, that high pass filter cutoff could be 0.05, 0.1, 0.5, 0.6, 7, 25, or 60 hertz. So some of the cards, I think like the um, XS and the V24, go down to 0.05 hertz or so. I think the XS also goes up to 25 hertz for a high pass filter. Most of the V8 cards can also have a seven hertz high pass filter. And if you're using a microphone card, the M8 can go up to a 60 hertz high pass filter. So make sure you uh, view the channel setup, um, look at the HP cutoff and make sure you know what frequency the high pass filter cutoff is on your channel setup. If you've already measured the data, uh, when you go into a run, I can look at the archive settings and I can show this here. So here's an example of a run. And if, if this was an acquisition run, you would see an option for viewing the channel setup or loading, loading the channel setup. So anytime you measure a run, we say the archive settings, at least in classic, and then you can right click and view the channel setup after the fact by looking at these archive settings. And that way you can see what high pass filter was used during the test. That is all I had. So let's see if there's any questions. Hello, just wondering how to determine your cutoff frequency when processing the frequency of the main data. Is there a rule of thumb? My rule of thumb is from one to two and a half hertz. You know, I'm gonna look at probably a one hertz high pass filter first, and then maybe look at the waterfall data or maybe the individual lines in the waterfall and seeing if there's any large displacements at low frequency. If I don't like the results, then I would maybe go up to two or two and a half hertz. I don't normally go too much higher than that. 
And then the overall level is another good check. Um, he also said um, correlation with the displacement sensor would be ideal. So if you've got some type of a displacement sensor, you, you can put on it first and then you get an accurate displacement reading and then correlate that to an accelerometer data that you double, integra double integrated down, that would be the ideal situation. 